Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know if Kickstarter is launching this week. If you're new to the channel, we do this every week, so if you want to stay up to date with all the campaigns coming down the line, don't forget that you can check out that subscribe button down below, and I truly appreciate it. Before we get started, I do like to cover a few new projects and games that I just found out about. I didn't end up doing this in last week's episode, so I actually have two weeks worth of games to cover here. I'll just go over them really quickly and the first one I want to cover is Dungeons, Dice and Danger. And this one is interesting for me because it's designed by Richard Garfield, which is a very prolific designer. He's had his hand in a ton of really famous games like Magic the Gathering, Keyforge, King of Tokyo and Android Netrunner. He's also designed a ton of other games as well, just breaching 200. And this one's going to be a roll and write where players are exploring a dungeon full of treasure and monsters. I'm not 100% if this one's going to Kickstarter or not, but since it's coming from Richard Garfield and being published by Alea, which is a subsidiary of Ravensburger. I think there's just a lot of very experienced hands in this pot here, so I just have high hopes for this game and I'm gonna be keeping an eye on it moving forward. And if you're interested in this one, I like to just subscribe on Board Game Geek to get notified of any updates to this page. And the next game I just heard about, and this one's gonna be launching in Q1 of 2022, and this is the next game from Lucky Duck Games in partnership with Van Ryder Games. And this is gonna be for a horror themed campaign game that's going to be either rated 16 plus or even 18 plus. I don't have too much info on the game but if you want to know more about the types of campaign games that Lucky Duck Games has created you can look up Destinies which is a game that they released I think in the past year that's been getting a lot of really positive reviews. They're a great publisher that doesn't seem to rush out their games and it looks like they're going to be taking a few risks with this one which I think is a great recipe when you're making a horror board game. And I know a lot of viewers are going to be excited for this next bit of info because Garfield Games just announced their next trilogy. And this is the same publisher that released both the North and West trilogies, which included games such as Paladins of the West Kingdom, Raiders of the North Sea, and Architects of the West Kingdom, as well as several other games. And this is a really impressive collection because three of these games are actually in the top 100 on Board Game Geek. And I think Shem Phillips is one of the few designers to actually have three games in the top 100. So really impressive accomplishments there. And this next trilogy is is going to be from the same designers and it's called the South Tigris Trilogy and this is going to include wafers of the South Tigris as well as scholars of the South Tigris and inventors of the South Tigris. The first one to be released will be the Wayfarers which is going to be more of an entry level into this trilogy and it's going to be releasing sometime between March and May of 2022 and then scholars is going to be released the following year around the same time and then inventors the year after that in 2024. They also mentioned that before they launched this first campaign they're going to be launching a campaign for the Viscounts expansion for the Viscounts of the West Kingdom. And this trilogy is going to be focused more on dice and dice mechanisms so you can expect mechanisms like dice worker placement and dice bag building and things like that. They also did mention their East trilogy but from their current schedule and what I extrapolated from the information that was provided it's not going to be released until about 2026. And for those of us video gamers out there, I do have some good news for you as well because we're going to be having a Far Cry board game released probably in early 2022. And I think this one will be going to Kickstarter, although I'm not 100% sure on that either. And then there's also an official Tomb Raider RPG being released. But I also wanted to mention that a new month has started. So if you want to see all the big campaigns to expect in this month, check out Board Game Code's channel. I'll leave a link to it right up here. And he has a ton of different videos that you can check out, but he also just released a video last week going over the campaigns launching this month so definitely go ahead and check that out if you want to see a little bit further into the future but with all that said let's check out the kickstarters and the first campaign we have launches on november 8th and it's called starfighters rapid fire and this plays one to four players and takes about 20 to 40 minutes to play and in this game players are going to be controlling a ship miniature out on a hexagonal board and they're also going to have their own personal player board and the player board is where all the action happens players are going to be rolling dice and then issuing the dice out on the different areas on their board in order to activate different systems which is going to move their ship and fire different weapons the game plays over a series of rounds and there's three phases each round the first phase is the dice rolling phase and in this phase all players will be rolling their dice to try and gain different icons because you're going to want to match those icons on your player board in order to activate the different systems so depending on what you want to activate you're going to be trying to roll certain icons and the interesting aspect about the dice rolling in this game is that you can actually roll as many times as you want and you can lock in any dice that you want over any roll the catch here is that any player can stop this dice rolling phase so ideally you're going to want to be that player so that you don't get stuck with dice that you 
don't actually have a use for. After that phase, players are gonna be assigning the dice to the different areas on their board, and there's five areas to choose from. There's the cockpit, where players need to put a die in order to activate any of the other individual systems on the board. And then once you do that, you can activate your phasers to either attack other players, or you could activate your shield system to repair your shields, or you could use the dice to move or rotate your ship, or alternatively, fire torpedoes that will actually chase after your opponents. The torpedoes can be fired down with your regular phaser weapon, so you just want to keep that in mind as you strategize your turn. And then during the third phase, any torpedoes that were shot just get moved closer to whatever opponent is closest. And another really interesting aspect of this game is the way that damage is dealt out to the other players. Damage is actually taken relative to your position to where you're fired at. So if you get fired on the left hand side, you're going to be taking damage on the left side of your ship. If you're getting fired at in the front or the back or the other side, you're going to be taking damage in those areas. And as you get hit there, a shield marker is going to get removed, indicating that that shield has been damaged. Once all the shield markers are removed from a given side, if you get hit on that side again, you're going to be removing a Hull marker. If you lose five of your hull markers, your ship's going to be destroyed and you're going to be eliminated from the game, and the last player standing is going to win the game. And another really cool aspect of this game is that all the shipboards are the same, but they each have a B-side. So if you want to change it up a little bit, you can actually switch your ship to the B-side. And all the ships are going to be a little bit different from each other, adding some asymmetry into the game. If you want to play a little bit differently with some different strengths and weaknesses amongst the players. And as always, if you're interested in any of these campaigns, I have links in the description below. And the next few games are launching on November 9th, and the first one we have is Gartenbau. And this plays two to four players and takes about 30 to 60 minutes to play. And this one looks like a really interesting tile placement. And if you like tile placement games, I definitely recommend checking this one out. It has a drafting aspect. We're going to be drafting some different tiles. You're going to be drafting your score tiles at the beginning of the game and then trying to work towards those. But those tiles are the last tiles that you place down on your board because you actually have to lay your tiles in layers, putting your smaller tiles on the bottom, and then based on the icons that you match up, up there you're going to be putting tiles on top of those and then finally you'll be able to put your scoring tiles on top of those tiles and this was a campaign that I thought was launching a couple weeks ago so I actually go into this one in a lot more detail in that video and I'll leave a link to that right up here if you want to check out more also launching on November 9th, we have Hegemony Lead Your Class to Victory. And this plays two to four players and takes about 90 to 180 minutes to play. And in this game, players are going to be representing different classes in society, either the working class, the middle class, the capitalist class, or as the state itself. While players are all going to have their own individual goals, they're all going to be eliminated by a series of policies that are going to be developing throughout the game based on what the players are lobbying for. And all the players' different roles are intertwined and affect each other, much like you would expect in in a real society, so this is a bit of a political economic simulator. The game also does allow negotiations, so some games can be more competitive while other games can be more cooperative. And this is also a game that I've already covered, so if you want to know more info on this one, check out the video right up here to see more details on Hegemony. Also launching on the 9th is Megapulse, and this plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 30-90 to 90 minutes to play. And this is a game that's influenced by a lot of video games such as F-Zero, Mario Kart, or Wipeout. And in this game, players are going to be racing around a treacherous board, running into different obstacles, and finding different resources to help them along their way. Players will be managing a hand of 7 cards and then simultaneously playing 2 of those cards as they progress around the track and try to be the first to cross the finish line. This is also a campaign that I've already covered in the past, so if you want to know more details on this one, I go into a lot more detail in the video I'll leave a link to right up here. And launching on November 9th, we have The Hand of Destiny, and this plays one player and takes about 10 to 20 minutes to play. And this is actually a game that I covered a few weeks ago because I thought it was launching earlier, but I actually got a ton of new information since then, so I'll go over this one again with the new info, because there's actually going to be three games in this campaign, and they're all solo games, and they're all going to take place in the same world with the same characters and art style, but they're going to be playing very different from each other. And this is the campaign that I'm most likely to back this week, so for that reason, it's going to be my pick of the week. And I'll just go through each of these games one by one and tell you a little bit about how they play. And the first one is for the Hand of Destiny. And this is the one that I'm most excited about out of the three, namely because you can play it in the palm of your hand. And that shouldn't be underestimated because it's a really nice feature for a solo game. Because you can just take this with you and play it almost anywhere at any time, it's really easy to get in a quick game. And in this game, you're going to be going through a deck of cards of waves of enemies. And at the end of that deck, there's going to be a boss and each card you can actually flip over and rotate 
rotate and each boss actually has four forms that it's going to go through so after you defeat the first boss you're going to be flipping that card and then defeating its second form and then so on and so forth until you've defeated its fourth form and at that point you win the game. You can play as a couple different characters and each character has six different abilities on their character sheet. Each of these also doubles as your health. So if you take damage you're going to be covering up an ability and you're not going to be able to use that unless you heal. And there's a few ways that you can damage enemies in this game. You can either use your abilities but this does come at a cost because these are more limited and you can only use your abilities about twice per wave. Some of your abilities also limit the amount of rewards that you'll get opposed to defeating the enemy in the main method which is by collecting strength cards that you can then spend to deal damage to those enemies. And the way that you get strength cards is by defeating enemies because each enemy card will also have a strength value and when you defeat it you'll be able to take that into your hand and then use it to try and defeat other enemies. Defeating enemies can also get you gold which you can spend to get new weapons and potions at the shop at certain points in the game. And another reason to be excited about this one is that the designer does have some experience making handheld games because he is also the one that designed Gloomholden which made a splash a few weeks back. And then we have the Forgotten Road and this one's going to be playing quite a bit differently with more of a focus on hand management and players are going to be playing as a party of characters rather than an individual character and you're going to be traveling down a deck of road cards. You can see the different road cards here and they have a few laid out in this picture but you only really need two road cards out at a time because you're always going to be on the leftmost card as you travel from the top portion of it down into the bottom portion and then over to the next card. Each card is going to have a location as well as a monster on it and you're going to be putting your pawn out on the card to indicate which area you are currently located and wherever you are you're going to have to try and meet the requirements there in order to move on to the next section. And the neat thing about this is that the requirements for each card are actually randomly generated because to see those requirements you need to put two cards together because the icons and artwork there will combine in order to show you what that full requirement is. To fulfill these different requirements you're going to be using a combination of action cards as well as dice rolling. And the action cards are actually multi-use. They're going to have an attack value, a movement value, and a number of icons visible. And each one of those you can use to fulfill the different requirements requirements of these different road cards but keep in mind whatever side you choose to use you're going to be discarding the other side so you're going to want to be efficient with the way that you use these cards. You'll also be able to roll some dice to get you some extra icons so that you don't have to use as many cards because the cards also double as your health and if you deplete that deck twice you lose the game. You're going to be going through these road cards repeating that process one by one until you reach the final boss and once you defeat the final boss you're going to be going through another deck but this is going to be a dungeon deck. And the game's going to play the same way and you're going to be moving through the dungeon and then you're going to be reaching a final boss in the dungeon and if you are able to defeat that boss then you win the game. Defeating enemies gains you gold and when you're on a location portion of a tile you can spend that gold for different potions to help you along the way but you can only do this twice per game. Each character also has its own individual special ability that can help you along the way but the characters also have health and if all your characters lose their health before you defeat the final boss then you can also lose the game that way. And the last game in this collection is for the last stronghold and this is a tower defense style game. Players are going to be trying to defend the castle against horde of enemies as they're going to be drawing these enemies from the deck and assigning them to the different locations specified on those cards. There's five different locations that monsters can spawn at but each location can only hold two monsters so if a location is full but more monsters continue to spawn there instead of spawning that monster you're going to put a corruption token there and once there's five corruption tokens that location is destroyed and any additional monsters that get spawned there are going to instead inflict damage on your stronghold. And once again you're going to be playing as a party of heroes each with their own special abilities and their special abilities do double as their health so if you use a special ability you're going to be flipping that hero to their injured side where they're going to have a different special ability and if you use that ability then that hero is going to be defeated and removed from the game so you're going to want to use these abilities sparingly so that you at least have one hero surviving by the end of the game. And on your turn you can visit any of the five locations and then you're going to be rolling dice to try and match icons on the dice with the icons on the monsters that have spawned there. If you're able to do that then those monsters are defeated and discarded from the game. 
Location cards can also gain treasure tokens, and if you spend a die matching the icon of the treasure token, you can get that treasure, but then you're not going to be using that die towards fighting monsters, so there is a cost to that. And treasure can get you some special abilities and magical artifacts to manipulate the dice and monsters, and if you defeat all the monsters before your hero's health runs out, or before the city is destroyed, then you win the game. So if you're looking to add some solo games to your collection, this is definitely one to check out. And if you're not too familiar with solo games, but you want to give them a try, I definitely recommend recommend grabbing one that plays in the palm of your hand, whether it's this one or Palm Island. They're just super accessible and really easy to just get out and play anytime you have some time to kill or if you want to take a quick break for yourself. And don't forget I have links in the description below and you can click to get notified. Launching on November 9th, we have Clash of Decks Season 2, and this plays 1-2 to two players and takes about 15-30 to 30 minutes to play. And this is a card battler where the goal of the game is to try to defeat your opponent's fort. And as the name implies, this is the second campaign. And the first campaign they had was actually a very interesting one because it was a very inexpensive campaign to get involved in. Pledge was only 2 euros, so you're basically just covering shipping. And then they would ship you a deck of cards so that players around the world could experience the game for themselves. This campaign is going to iterate on the work that they did from the first campaign and also introduce six new standalone expansion decks. And in this game players will have their own hand of cards to attack their opponents with and the game plays in three different modes. You can either use the pre-constructed hand of cards that are defined by the rules of the game or you can use a drafting mechanism to draft heroes into your hand or the constructed mode where players will be defining the cards that they use in their own hands which is the more advanced mode of play. Players will each have eight cards in their hand and the order does matter because you can only play cards left to right. And then there's the special card which is the fort card which each player is trying to protect from their opponent. Players are going to be alternating turns and there's three phases in a turn. First you're going to be generating mana equal to the number of cards in your hand. And then you're going to go into the summoning phase where you're going to be spending that mana in order to play the cards in your hand. Although players are limited to playing their cards left to right, they do have some flexibility when it comes to putting their card out on the table. There's going to be two bridges out on the table table and each one represents a lane and players can decide if they want to put it in the first bridge or the second bridge's lane. One side of the bridge represents one player's realm while the other side represents the other players. Once players have played all the cards that they're able to play, it moves into the assault phase where the player can activate the cards to inflict damage on the other side of the bridge. Cards do replenish all their health at the end of a turn, so you're going to want to try and inflict enough damage to deplete a card's health completely and send it back into your opponent's hand. If there's no more cards left on your opponent's side, then your damage will be inflicted on their fort. And this has a really interesting health tracking mechanism because the health of your fort is going to be represented by its position in your hand of cards. Each time you inflict damage on the fort, it's going to move a card right in your opponent's hand. And once it reaches the end twice, that fort is destroyed and you win the game. I love seeing card battlers that do something a little bit differently, and this one definitely is. So if it interests you, don't forget you can check out the campaign in the description below. Also launching on November 9th, we have Cheese Royale, and this plays 2-6 to six players and takes about 20-40 to 40 minutes to play. And this is a mouse survival and combat game where players are competing to be the last surviving mouse. And players are going to be exploring a hex-based map, trying to find different resources and combat cards, but also running into different traps along the way. And each round an event card is going to be drawn that's going to have game-changing effects that affect every player, and each player is going to have two actions on their turn. They can either take their sniff action that allows them to view a tile without activating it or they can perform the move action where they can move to a different tile but then they also have to flip over that tile and resolve the effects. Players can also choose to attack another player and fights are resolved based on the mouse's characteristics along with their equipment and fight cards that they used in combat. After their two actions are used their turn ends and then they consume one food. If a player doesn't have any food at the end of their turn they also lose one health. The game continues until there's only one mouse left and that player wins the game. Also launching on November 9th, we have Ancient Blood, The Order of the Vampire Hunters, and this is the prequel to The Order of the Vampire Hunters, which played 1-4 to four players and takes about 90 minutes to play. I don't have too much more info on this new game, but I imagine it'll have about the same playtime and player count, and it is a completely new game, although it takes some inspiration from the original. It is not going to be compatible with the previous release. But this is a story-driven game where the decisions you make will influence how the game develops and how the end of the story is resolved, and the game's going to offer some new features like exploration, crafting, resource management, and leveling up. And if you enjoyed the original or if this one sounds like it might be interesting to you, you can sign up to their newsletter and it'll also sign you up to win an exclusive resin miniature as well as a printed illustration. Also launching on November 9th, we have the Honey Buzz Fall Flavor.
Flavors expansion. This plays one to four players and takes about 45 to 80 minutes to play. And this is the expansion for the game Honey Buzz. And this is a game that's got a ton of amazing reviews. It's a really solid game and there's a ton of content out there already if you want to see how this game plays or see what other people thought about it. But generally this game is a bee worker placement game. You're going to get these really cool bee meeples or beeples and you're going to be putting these out on the board in order to gain different honeycomb tiles each with their own different icon and special action that it allows you to perform. Taking a tile allows you to put it into your play area connecting it to your existing tiles to form out your beehive. Whenever a player completes a circle of tiles all those tiles get activated allowing you to perform the actions depicted on those tiles in any order that you choose. And the different patterns that you make are also going to allow you to gain different honey tiles that you get to put in the middle of these circles and these are going to help you produce different types of honey in order to fulfill different orders and gain income. And don't let the cute bees and artwork fool you, this game is actually one of the most strategic games that I've ever played. It's probably on the same level of chess in terms of strategy but a lot more fun and a lot better to look at. The game has a very low amount of randomness, which means that everything you do really matters and it has a huge impact on the options that you have moving forward. The game offers a lot of tension, but it doesn't come from take that or harming your players. Instead, you're just kind of getting in each other's way because there's a limited number of actions that can be taken. But because of all that, it also feels very rewarding when you're able to build the hive the way that you want and to trigger the actions that you need to perform different combos and perform an epic turn. But just like with chess, the more you play, the better you You'll get so if you haven't played this game before and you're jumping into a game with experienced players just be prepared that you're probably going to be coming in last place and it'll probably take you a few games before you get on their level if you want to know more about how this game plays i highly recommend watching board game coffee's review on it it gives you all the info you need to play the game but it's also super entertaining and even if you're not interested in this game just go watch the video i'll leave a link to it right up here you won't regret it and this expansion is going to add five new modules that can be mixed and matched into the game however you like and the first module is the fall fruit module and this has players collecting fruit rather than pollen in order to fulfill different orders but it also gives players the option to hang on to their fruit till later in the game to fulfill more difficult special orders but that are also worth more points. And then there's the autumn leaves module which allows players to decorate their hives with fall colored leaves, earning victory points based on the foliage card that was revealed for that game. And then there's the nectar caps module which allows players to put caps on their nectar cells to prepare them for winter and this will score you massive points at the end of the game but it will also slow down your nectar production during the game so there's a bit of a trade-off there as players will want a time when they actually cap off their nectar pods in order to maximize their points. And then there's the Harvest Festival module where players will be able to retire their workers for special effects. And then there's the Sweetwater Sunset module that allows players to track the progress towards the end of the game. And when the sun finally sets, the game is going to end. If you're a fan of worker placement, high strategy, and low luck, this is definitely a game that I recommend checking out. It's going to give you all of that with a solid design and a beautiful package. Links in the description below. Launching on November 10th, we have Resurgence, and this plays one to four players and takes about 60 to 90 minutes to play. And this is coming from the designer Stan Kardonsky, who's designed a ton of games, including Endless Winter and Rurik Don of Kiev. And in this game, players are going to be competing in a post-apocalyptic world, leading a crew of survivors. This is a Euro-style game that's going to mix worker bag building, hidden worker placement, and resource management. In each round, players are going to secretly choose which workers to assign to different areas of the map, and the different areas areas represent different regions where players can gain influence in those individual regions. Players will be trying to complete different missions in each of these different regions to gain influence there but also to gain a reward depending on their mission that they've accomplished. Each mission card completed is going to be added to your personal player board which is going to generate you resources each round so it kind of creates a little engine that you're going to be building up throughout the game. Players are going to be gathering fuel, food, weapons, and other resources to spend throughout the game to do things such as building or upgrading their base which is also going to help them complete harder missions and increase the amount of workers that you're allowed to draw from your bag. Each worker is a survivor and it's going to have its own unique skill and you can actually rescue more survivors throughout the game adding more workers into your bag. Completing missions and gaining influence is going to earn you victory points and the player with the most victory points unites the other factions and becomes the leader of all the factions and wins the game. I'm just skimming over the rules here, but Man vs. Meeple put out a great video outlining more details of the game, and I'll leave a link to that right up here. 
And on November 11th, we have The Weather Machine, and this is a game from Vital Lacerda that plays one to four players and takes about 60 to 150 minutes to play. And this one is our Discord pick of the week. And in this game, there is a well-intentioned professor who has built a machine capable of controlling the weather. Although this is built with the greater good in mind, the machine is not perfect and is causing extreme weather. And players are going to be playing as scientists working for the professor, but doing their own research to try and solve some of the issues with the machine while getting help and grants from the government. Players are each going to have their own player board. On the left-hand side is an assembly line that they're going to be using to build different bots that they're going to be able to place out on different areas of the board in order to perform different actions. And the middle here is going to represent the different grants you're going to be getting from the government and other sources that are represented by different vouchers. So you can think of this as funding towards your scientific research, and you're going to be able to get some different kinds of funding and spend those to perform different actions out on the main board. The next area of the board is where players can store the scientific research that they've conducted throughout the game. And if they complete three publications to fill up an entire row, they're going to have a scientific breakthrough, which they're going to indicate by moving this token to the right hand side and gaining special abilities for that. Then finally, on the right of the board, players each have their own workshop where they'll put any workshop tiles that they gain throughout the game. And in order to place a workshop tile here, you'll have to match the colors on the edge of the tile with the tiles that are already existing there. And this will allow players to store more resources like additional robots, chemicals, and machine parts that they'll be using throughout the game. And just like with most Lacerda games, there's a ton of components out on the board and it looks super complicated, but with this one, it's actually pretty straightforward once you get into it. There's only four different locations to place your main worker. There's the government, the lab, the research and development, and storage supply areas. Each round, players perform one action by moving their scientist meeple to one of the available action spaces. The only catch here is you can't put your meeple in the same spot it was in your previous turn. Each of these locations have a little bit more going on to them than what I'm going to describe. And also there's three action spaces per location that has a little bit of variation on the way that you perform your actions there. But placing your meeple at the government location is going to allow players to sell parts that they've collected for income and subsidies from the government. The center area is the professor's weather machine, and this is where different experiments are going to get conducted to run for the different weather types. And players will want to get their bots out onto these areas to complete those experiments. Then they also want their meeple there when the machine gets activated because you're going to gain some special rewards if you're in that action location when that gets triggered. And on the far right of the board we have the research and development action spaces where players can go to research the different weather types and if they're able to fulfill the requirements of those research they're going to gain a research token that they can put on their player board which will help them work towards completing different breakthroughs which in turn help solve problems with the professor's weather machine. And then finally at the bottom of the board we have the storage and supply action area where players can visit to get more resources like chemicals or more workshop tiles. And the game continues like this, players performing one action at a time until one of the four end game conditions is met, triggering the end of the game. Either a player is able to complete three rows here to complete three breakthroughs, earning them a Nobel Prize, winning them the game, or one of the three action areas is fully completed. If the government funding area is no longer able to buy parts, then it ends the game, or if all research has been conducted on the machine, that ends the game, or if there's no more research and development to be completed in the research development action area, then that also ends the game. If the game ends in one of these three ways, then the player with the most victory points wins the game. And on November 11th, we have Exploration Warzone, and this plays two to three players and takes about five to 15 minutes to play. And this is a space-themed game in which players are going to be controlling different spaceships with asymmetrical abilities and jumping into a space battle. And players are going to be fighting across different hexes that are going to be diminishing throughout the game. And in this game, players are going to be balancing deck building and hand management as they're collecting different cards to perform different actions, but also balancing that with different resources that they're finding throughout the game that's going to help give them an advantage over their opponents. There's a few different ways that players can win the game. They can either be the last player standing, or they can be the first player to collect two relics, or the first player to reach 15 victory points, or once time runs out, the player with the most victory points wins the game. And there's an early bird for those that back in the first day. And on November 12th, we have Call of the Wild, and this plays three to six players and takes about five to 15 minutes to play. And in this game, each player is gonna have a pack of 10 cards, and they're gonna be drawing two into their hand. Each card is gonna have an animal on it, as well as where it fits in the food chain and the sounds that each animal makes. There's no turns in this game, instead players can just put a card face down on the table and then make a sound of any one of the animals that they choose. They can be honest and make the sound of the animal that they put down, or they can be dishonest and make the sound of any other animal. 
Any other player at the table can put down a card of their own, and if the players decide, they can both choose to reveal their cards, and the cards are going to be resolved depending on the animals that are revealed. If the cards match, then each player scores one point, but if the cards don't match, it's important to note that each animal can be eaten and eat only one other animal. So if one of those two animals eats the other, then that player is going to gain two points. So this can create different strategies where a player might put down an animal face down, but then make the sound of the animal it eats, hoping that someone else will put that animal out there, and then they'll be able to eat that card. But if a player suspects you're being dishonest and trying to eat their card, they could always put down the other animal that would eat the card that they suspect you have. But if the two cards don't match and neither of them eat each other, then no player gets any points and both cards are discarded. The game continues like this until one player no longer has any cards in their hand and the player with the most victory points wins the game. And then on November 13th we have the Cyborg RPG and this is coming from the same project creator that created the Morkborg series which is more of a Doom Metal tabletop RPG theme whereas this one's going to be more of a spinoff with a cyberpunk theme. And in this game, players are going to be playing as cybernetic punks and misfits fighting against the corrupt police forces and corporate systems. The game will touch on many themes common to the genre, and it offers a rules light RPG experience. And those are all the campaigns I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we have a couple awesome giveaways to announce. And the first one is for Damnation the Gothic Game. And in this game, players are different characters, each with their own asymmetric abilities. And they are going to be exploring Dracula's castle, trying to find the different rooms, and explore the different decks in each individual room for some powerful cards to help them fight and defend themselves against the other players. When players are defeated, they flip their board and they can continue to play by haunting the other players and putting obstacles in their way. One player can also play as Dracula, which makes them immortal and they'll want to feed on the other players, but the catch here is that they have to make it back to their chamber periodically or else they lose the game. As the game continues, random cards are going to be revealed that are going to add some brutal rules to the game, making it more difficult for the remaining players to survive. The game continues until there's only one player left living and that player wins the game. And this giveaway is going to be for the core game plus expansion pledge and to enter this giveaway just leave a comment down below with the hashtag Dracula and let us know what you dressed up as for Halloween. You all got to see me in my last video so I'm interested to know what you dressed up as. And the next giveaway we have is not for a board game but instead a really cool component and this is a 2 inch coin that can be used in place of rolling different dice such as the d4, the d6, the d8, 10, 12, and d20. And the way that this works is that the coin has different numbers on each side and depending on the die that you want to roll you'll just flip the coin to the appropriate side, give it a spin, and then you just put your finger on it to stop it and whatever number is beside your finger is the number that you rolled. I personally think the coin has a really impressive design that makes it really intuitive and keeps it from looking too cluttered so that you can see exactly the number that you're looking for really quickly. And one use case for this coin that I think is really cool is you can use it as a variable timer because when you spin it, it usually spins for about one to two minutes, adding a little bit of variability which you don't get with the traditional sand timer. And this giveaway is going to be for the coin Sides Dragon Pledge which gets you one coin shipped out December of this year. And to enter this giveaway, just head over to our Discord, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. And all you have to do is go ahead and click this little emoji under the giveaways channel, and that'll get you automatically entered into this giveaway. Good luck in the contest. And now let's go ahead and draw the winners for last week's giveaways. But first, I'm going to get some sleep. And the first giveaway we had was for City of the Great Machine. And to draw a winner, I use this fancy application here. And all these extra names down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you like this sort of content and you want to help support the channel while also getting some bonus entries into these giveaways, you can find out more about my Patreon in the description below. And I truly appreciate you taking a look. But with that said, let's go ahead and draw the winner. And the winner is... Jeremy Vickers, congratulations Jeremy, I'll reach out to you and let you know that you won yourself a pledge for City of the Great Machine. And the next giveaway we had was for King Hill, and to enter this one all you had to do is leave a comment on One Stop Co-op Shop's Extra Life announcement video. And I just want to say I'm really impressed with all the comments here, I know it means a lot to them and I know it's going to mean a lot to the children at the Children's Hospital where all these donations are going towards. So really great work here and really appreciate everyone jumping in there and showing your support. And a neat little happenstance is that today is actually November 6th, so they actually already started streaming. So if you want to check out some live playthroughs while also getting involved in the comments, go ahead and check out their streaming channel. I'll leave a link to that right up here. But for now, let's go ahead and draw that winner. And the winner is... J.R. Henton. Congratulations, Jay. Just reach out to me at adam at shelfclutter.com and I'll get that pledge all sorted out for you. 
That's everything I had for you this week, but I did just want to take a second and thank all the viewers for leaving comments on my videos as well. They've all been really supportive and it's really nice to see and it's really nice to get that feedback that the content is providing value, but it's also really cool just to see all the individual comments and the nice things that you guys have to say. So thanks a lot, I really appreciate it and it's not being overlooked, but I won't get too mushy. So until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and table full.